Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar, Optimize Network Availability, Security, and Automation on AWS. My name is Anjali Vijay Kumar. I'll be one of the speakers and a moderator for today's webinar. I'm a Partner Solutions Architect at AWS. I work very closely with a lot of our partners in the networking space who are building some amazing products to make networking easy on the cloud. I'm also joined today by Rod from Aviatrix and Dave from Factset. Rod and Dave, a quick hello before we get started. Hello everyone, this is Rod. Look forward to talking with you today. Thanks for joining. Hey, this is Dave Shinnick from Factset. Thanks for joining us. Thanks guys. All right, so networking is the glue that connects all of your elements together in the cloud. To run your workloads efficiently, it's important that the networking backbone is secure, is resilient, and that you are able to rely on AWS to give you the best possible performance as your workloads grow and expand in the cloud, whether it be hybrid connectivity, automated network provisioning, monitoring, and operational visibility, across the breadth of your business, you can leverage AWS and Aviatrix together to get enterprise class advanced networking and security capabilities on AWS. So here's what the AWS Global Backbone Network looks like. When it comes to networking, footprint and reliability matter. AWS has a global footprint with 24 regions around the world and 77 availability zones today. And these numbers continue to grow. We also have 216 CloudFront points of presence. CloudFront is our content delivery network service, and these are our CDN locations around the world. We also have 97 direct connect locations today to connect from your on-premises environments to AWS. And everything you see on here is a redundant 100 GB Ethernet fiber network spanning the globe. And it's all private network capacity, either owned or leased by AWS. That is to say, all controlled by AWS. A resilient global backbone is hugely important when talking about security we want our customers' traffic between regions to go over our backbone that we control rather than trusting that or leaving that to another provider or an ISP. <clears throat> Secondly, availability. We make sure that the AWS backbone has enough capacity at all times to carry customer workloads um, rather than leaving that to the ISPs out on the internet that might not be able to handle the scale of the workloads um, say, if multiple of our customers' traffic spike at the same time. We're also able to control any problems with availability. So let's say we have a broken piece of fiber somewhere. We are able to quickly route around that, and our systems are all automated to do that. Third one is performance, making sure that our customers benefit from the very best network performance in terms of throughput and the lowest possible package loss for your workloads. And finally, proximity. More and more applications today have a global user base. You might be hosting your service in one AWS region, but have users all over the world. So we make sure that our backbone spans to all of those locations. So your customer's traffic, rather than coming in over local ISPs, is coming in over the AWS backbone. So we do an enormous amount to be able to say that all region-to-region -region traffic, with the exception of a China region, traverses our backboard. So AWS is a great place to be. All right, I want to start with some AWS networking fundamentals. Uh, this looks like a busy slide, but I'll walk you through some important components to be aware of when setting up your networking on AWS. And this is just a comprehensive slide to show you some different options and services that are available today. So what we have here is an AWS region and an Amazon VPC. A VPC is a regional level construct, so it spans availability zones. When you create a VPC, you get to choose and assign an IPv4 CIDR range for your VPC. You can also expand your VPC by adding on additional IPv4 CIDR ranges. And you can also optionally assign an IPv6 CIDR block to your VPC. You see two availability zones here um, with a couple of public subnets and a couple of private subnets where you have your EC2 instances. And this is inside the VPC. 
There are also services like S3, DynamoDB, and so on that don't sit inside of a VPC but are public services. We have VPC endpoints to talk to services like S3, which allow you to privately connect to these services without leaving the Amazon network. And your EC2 instances that are connecting to S3, for example, don't need to have public IP addresses. Now, on the right here, to connect from your on-premises network, you can connect over VPN using AWS managed site-to-site -site VPN service or connect over Direct Connect, which gives you a dedicated network connection from your on-premises environment to AWS, completely bypassing the internet. For connectivity to other VPCs um, in the same or a different AWS region, you can use VPC peering, which allows you to route traffic between VPCs using private IP addressing. And for inter-region VPC peering, that is peering between two different AWS regions, all region-to-region -region traffic is encrypted and goes over our backbone. And then we have Transit Gateway for interconnecting thousands of VPCs together. Up to 5,000 VPCs can be attached to one Transit Gateway. It serves as a network transit hub in AWS, and you can also connect to it over VPN from your on-premises network. <laughs> we also have Private Link, which provides private connectivity. There's two flavors of Private Link. One is where you connect your VPCs to private link enabled AWS services, services like API Gateway, Aurora, for example. Um, there's a long list of 40 plus AWS services you can access privately using interface VPC endpoints powered by private link. And the other flavor is to connect to SaaS providers or a service provider VPC. SaaS providers can create their applications in a VPC and configure it for private link support and allow private connectivity from a consumer VPC. For monitoring, we also have VPC flow logs, which are logs of your network flows, showing you the five tuple um, and the details of the number of packets sent, bytes sent, and so on. And these can be sent to either an S3 bucket or CloudWatch. And lastly, our global accelerator service, another service using which you can leverage our backbone. A global accelerator gives you a pair of any cars static IP addresses to act as an entry point to your application endpoints hosted in any AWS region. Um, the Anycast IPs are Anycast from our edge locations around the world, bringing your customer traffic onto the AWS backbone and to your applications hosted in AWS. So these are some different connectivity options that are available for customers today. Um, some customers use some of these features, or you may find that you need to use a combination of some of these features and services. Um, and lastly, the cool part about this is that you don't have to set up any of this manually. You can leverage Aviatrix's solutions to automate all of this, um, automate your network connectivity, uh, your routing on AWS. Now, one cool routing feature that I do want to talk more about is the VPC ingress routing feature. Uh, we announced this feature last year at reInvent around November 2019. Uh, this feature makes it easy for customers to deploy their own third-party security or networking appliances in a VPC. So what this feature allows you to do is associate a route table called a gateway route table either with an internet gateway or a virtual private gateway. Previously, you could only associate a route table at the subnet level. So now with this feature, you can treat these gateways as border routers for your VPC. Using fine-grained routing rules here, you can redirect your traffic to a third-party security or networking appliance before it reaches the actual destination. So what you see here is a gateway route table, in this case associated with an internet gateway. I have a rule in here to say that any traffic that is meant for instance B, I want to send it to a firewall, firewall A here. So traffic comes in via the IGW, it's first sent to the firewall because of the routing rule. The firewall can inspect the traffic and then the traffic is forwarded onto the destination. The same also applies for a gateway route table that is, that is associated with a virtual private gateway. 
and you can automate this as well and programmatically set this up with Aviatrix's controller. Uh, Rod later on is going to talk about a use case that uses this feature along with Amazon Guard Duty to orchestrate advanced filtering for traffic coming into your AWS um, environment. What is Guard Duty? Um, it's a managed threat detection service. It does continuous monitoring of your AWS accounts and your AWS resources. Um, it has the concept of one-click activation, where with one click or one API call, you can make the Guard Duty service active in your account and in your region. Um, the types of threats that Guard Duty detects are both known threats and unknown threats. Uh, for known threats, we leverage threat intelligence to detect known bad actors. That's the base layer. And on top of that, we also provide protection against unknown threats. And this is done using behavior-based and machine learning-based analysis. And lastly, it gives you enterprise-wide consolidation and management. Today, customers might have multiple AWS accounts and they're using AWS organizations. Um, Guard Duty integrates with organizations where you can check a box and say, enable Guard Duty in every single account that's vended in my AWS organization without needing any additional configuration. So how Guard Duty works is that it looks at three different data sources. If you look at these data sources, these are all log-based. Uh, but the key thing to point out here is that you don't have to enable any of these log sources, and you're not charged for these logs either because we get these from the backend. Uh, VPC flow logs, similar to NetFlow, you can get data on what IP you're communicating with, uh, the port, the protocol, the amount of data that was transferred, and also the directionality of the traffic. Um, this gives us information that allows us to identify say, if your instance is communicating with a known IP on our threat intelligence list. And it also feeds into our data models. So we are able to detect any unusual behavior for a given instance. So say the instance is suddenly transferring a huge amount of data, and that is unusual for that instance. DNS logs are DNS query logs using the internal VPC DNS resolver in a VPC. Using this, we can analyze all of the domains that your instances are querying and compare that to a threat intelligence list. And lastly, cloud trail logs to identify activity to the API from potentially malicious IP addresses. And also, this is how we build machine learning models to understand what is normal activity for a given user in your account. The last service I'll touch on today is Control Tower. It's a service that makes it easy for you to set up, scale, and govern your multi-account setup on AWS. It allows you to enable, provision, and operate your AWS environment with business agility and governance control. So your developers can have the agility that they need to build and innovate on AWS, while there are central policies for security, compliance, and spend management that can all be governed centrally with Control Tower. There's four main components for governance on AWS. One is that it sets up a landing zone on AWS. AWS. A landing zone is a well-architected multi-account AWS environment set up using AWS organizations, and this is based on best practices. Second is to centralize identity and access management. Third, it allows for establishing guardrails for governance. Um, AWS best practices policies that you can implement across your <coughs> AWS environment. And these are pre-configured governance rules for security, compliance, and operations, all curated by AWS from working with many of our enterprise customers. And so some examples being requiring MFA for the root user, this allow public read access for SV buckets and so on. And these come out of the box um, as guardrails in Control Tower. And lastly, automating a compliant account provisioning process. Um, it has a feature called Account Factory, which allows you to automate the account provisioning process using templates um, where you can define your basic network configuration settings, for example, um, allowing you to standardize your accounts. And Rod is going to talk more about this as well in a bit, about how you can use Aviatrix to automate the network connectivity setup for new accounts in your control tower environment. 
And once you set up Control Tower, you can manage all of these components continuously for ongoing governance. Uh, with that, I'm now going to pass it over to Rod from Aviatrix. Fantastic, Anjali. That was a great background for all of the fundamental capabilities that AWS provides from a networking perspective, from a security perspective. Now I want to talk a little bit about Aviatrix, if I can get my slide to move here, um, and, and why Aviatrix on AWS. Really what we do is we maintain the simplicity and automation that you expect from cloud and that AWS is delivering and add the enterprise class visibility and control that your IT departments are looking for. So we're maintaining the speed and agility that everybody's used to, and then adding some of these enterprise customer requirements like advanced networking and security features, and then operational visibility and troubleshooting capabilities that the teams need. Now, this is all very simple to deploy. A lot of this looks very complex, but it's simple to deploy, and it is a better together solution where we're leveraging some of the capabilities of the Aviatrix product uh, in line with and in conju conjunction with the native services that are being provided by AWS. So to understand a couple of the components here, we have the Aviatrix controller, which you can think of as the brain of the operations. It's talking to our own gateways, which are providing the advanced networking and security capabilities but it's also talking to the native services via the AWS native API. So we can take advantage of all of the cloud native capabilities that are there and then deliver a lot of the advanced services on top of that. And then finally at the top right, the Aviatrix Copilot is our visualization platform that I'll talk about that gives you that ability to do deep operational visibility. Now, as we do this, you can think of the, this as building a single network architecture that can be deployed across AWS or across multiple clouds so that you end up with a consistent um, operational control, consistent security that goes across your entire cloud environment. And it leverages the central controller to do this because the central controller, as I mentioned, is the brain of the operations but it also has the ability to talk multiple languages. So it talks multiple APIs. And we provide a multi-cloud Terraform provider. So leveraging that ability for the controller to talk multiple languages, this multi-cloud Terraform provider gives you the ability to write one module that's gonna work across multiple clouds and be able to deploy your environments in a very repeatable way. Now, if I talk about advanced networking control, I wanna give you an idea of some of the things that, that we talk about here, and then I'll show that in a diagram a little bit later. But from networking capabilities like active-active high availability and redundant pathing, so our, our gateways are connected together in a way that gives you the ability to maximize performance and availability in your transit network. Uh, we also deliver BGP traffic engineering capabilities so that you can bring the intelligence of BGP from on-prem into the cloud and leverage capabilities like AS path prepending so that you can optim take the optimal path. And then we can do things like uh, deliver multiple transit hubs in a single region. If you have different business units that want their own transit environment in a region, we can pull, put together multiple transit environments in a single region and then have those go across regions and across clouds. We also help you uh, extend your security po policy or enhance your security policy uh, by leveraging the correctness capability of the, the intelligent controller to make sure that we're not configuring things in the wrong way and then providing you some granular security controls. One of those controls is multi-cloud network segmentation. So that ability to actually put together uh, network segments or security domains, but also carry those across multiple clouds um, to, so that you can maintain compliance as you move across, uh, across clouds. And then end-to-end -end and high-performance encryption. All of our connections are IPsec connect, uh, encrypted, 
but we can also deliver high performance encryption up to 75 gigabits per second inside the cloud and at wire speed from on-prem to the cloud over your connections like Direct Connect. And then finally here, um, what we call fully qualified domain name or FQDN filtering for egress. So all of your VPCs that need to talk to the internet in order to maintain compliance with, for instance, PCI uh, regulations, you need to be able to filter traffic that's going to the internet. We have a very easy way of deploying that and allowing that to be consistent across all your cloud environments. And then finally, the enterprise class operational visibility. This is Copilot, our visualization tool. We start with a picture here of a dynamic topology mapping. So the ability to see everything in your network, how it's connected, and drill into any one of those network resources and get details about what's happening on that. And this again, in this picture, we're showing all AWS environment, but if this was a multi-cloud environment, we would be able to see your multi-cloud environment as well. And for any of your network connectivity, being able to drill into traffic flow analytics, see who's talking to who, drill all the way down into exactly the ports and protocols that are being used on any one of those flows, do packet capture of things, uh, troubleshooting tools like ping and trace route from anywhere in the, in the network. Uh, we also give you the ability to do route table analysis and then some uh, useful tools like tagging and clustering so that you can search and name groups of uh, network resources uh, on your own. Now I wanna, I wanna transition and talk a little bit about some of our API integration that we have uh, with some of the products that Anjali talked about, VPC ingress routing and control tower. I'll start with VPC ingress routing. Now in this case, the controller is going to deploy everything that's needed, starting with deploying a VPC. Once the VPC is in place, we have the ability to deploy the Aviatrix gateway and the ingress routing function and configure all of the routing necessary to direct the traffic into the gateway. Then all of your workloads are connecting through the gateway. Now you need to define what is it that's going to be filtered for ingress routing here. So what we're doing in this case is we're gonna go talk to the uh, Amazon guard duty and pull the malicious IP information that's held in guard duty and then push that into the gateway so that we can filter on those malicious IPs. So that simply, in an automated way, we can set up a filtering system to, fil to filter on these malicious IPs. So we can drill in and look at exactly what's being filtered. We can modify that and add or change it. So that's ingress filtering. And we can also do egress filtering, where we define white lists of FQDN filtering and apply that into the gateway as well. So now I'm going to filter on any outbound traffic to make sure it's only going to known destinations. Now let me talk a little bit about the uh, network factory for AWS Control Tower. There's three real components of this. It's the, the Control Tower master account uh, area, the infrastructure uh, organizational unit, which is where the Aviatrix uh, controller and our operational visibility would exist, and then the business unit region that you're gonna be deploying into. So in this case, the whole system starts off with a event trigger, a lifecycle event trigger, which will call the Aviatrix controller, and it will go through many steps to set up the VPC and all the connectivity for that VPC, making sure, for instance, that there's no overlapping siders uh, that are, are deployed in this case. And this can be done for many VPCs. Let's say this account needs uh, a dev environment, a test environment, and a production environment. All of those v VPCs with all of the guardrails associated from control tower can be deployed automatically. And then finally, all of this then feeds into the operational visibility of, of Copilot that we talked about. Now let's look at some of the advanced controls that I talked about, the advanced networking within the picture of a next generation transit. And there's several pieces here. Number one is all of the capabilities that are delivered by the AWS infrastructure. 
Number two is our controller that we've talked about. Number three is the gateways, as you can see those deployed around in the infrastructure. And number four is the operational visibility. So let's drill into some of this. So for instance, from a transit perspective, you can see that we have multiple gateways with full mesh connectivity for high availability. We do end-to-end -end encryption between any of these uh, gateways. We're doing the intelligent traffic engineering that I talked about, and we can have multiple transit hubs in region and deal with multi-account, multi-region, multi-cloud. You can see this can be extended beyond one cloud into multiple clouds. And then of course, the enterprise class visibility and control that comes from this transit environment. You can also do high performance encryption for your direct connect route. So if you have a 10 gig direct connect, we can give you 10 gig of IPsec encryption off over that, not just the 1.25 that normally you would get. And again, 75 gig within the cloud. And then egress filtering, we talked a little bit about that, and um, FactSet will mention how they're using this as well, but to, to comply with regulatory compliance for outbound connections to the internet. And then if you want to centralize that function, bringing it in and being able to connect it to your next generation firewalls, for instance, we have what we call firewall network or FireNet, where we can orchestrate the deployment of your next generation firewalls. And then, as I mentioned before, all of this great visibility across this entire uh, network environment, feeding the, the visibility tools that we talked about. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Rod and Anjali. Uh, it's really exciting to see all the tools and options available to us. Uh, so to recap, my name is Dave Shinnick. I'm a principal systems architect with Faxert, Faxert Research Systems. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Faxert and what we do as a technology company, we were founded in 1978, delivering sets of fax via Mike Messenger to investment professionals. We're now a global financial services company listed on NYSE and NASDAQ, public since 1996. But we're still very focused on data with more than half of our 10,000 employees collecting content for our data sets. And as the world underwent technological transformation, fax sets data delivery shifted from Bike Messenger to dial up and eventually broadband. 40 years later, and we're still providing high-quality content, award-winning analytics products to our clients. But now our product's ready at the speed of cloud. Our flexible, open data and software solutions are available to tens of thousands of investment professionals around the world, from sheets of paper to APIs. With instant, anytime, anywhere access, investors are empowered to make crucial decisions in real time. By leveraging elements of our solution or powering their websites with our feeds, our clients have the ability to create, and execute upon highly interactive portals, either hosted by FactSet or by any other third party. And our flexible technology allows our clients to access content via many channels, whether it be on their mobile device, their iPad at home, or their workstation in their office. So like most modern companies, FactSet's network underpins the technology stack we use to provide these industry leading solutions to our clients. And as network engineers, what are some of the challenges we face when trying to design and operate our networks to meet those needs? Well, we all know that telecom provisioning can have long lead times and often frustratingly variable delivery times. Sometimes there might be client demand or performance benefits to deploying in a new geographic region, but high minimum startup costs can make it prohibitive to deploy there without a critical mass of subscribers. There's also the long-term implica implications of sizing and design decisions that we have to make without the benefit of hindsight. And legacy operating systems can be op uh, difficult to operate stably at scale. My first change control as a network engineer was enabling a network interface for a server. That simple change needed to be authored, peer-reviewed, authorized, and deployed. You know, and as the years went on, the interface speeds would increase from one gig, 10 gig, 25 gig, and so on. And maybe the way we, we executed or rolled out that change would be different, perhaps using scripting or Ansible. But while other IT and sysadmin teams managing operating systems saw revolutionary changes from virtualization and with the radical new ways of orchestrating their environment, the network grew in size and capacity, but the underlying configuration model stayed roughly the same. When new tools came out, they often felt like an afterthought, something bolted on a network operating system so that had their origin during a different time than where the industry was heading. But it's our job as technologists to remove these barriers and replace them with tools and opportunities. Our developers need infrastructure agility. Our clients need a stable and evolving product. 
and our network teams need a platform that allow them to spend more time focusing on performance or design and less time on implementation. And Jolly laid out earlier the opportunities and features on AWS, and Rod went through some of the tools Aviatrix provides to make the most of that platform. And by combining Aviatrix and AWS, FactSec can now deploy infrastructure that scales elastically in minutes. We can implement solutions that can be sized and tailored to the customer demand rather than minimum deployment size. We have an environment built as software defined from the ground up that allows us to leverage declarative configuration models. And instead of spending hours rolling out changes, our time spent implementing a solution is just the tip of the iceberg. We have more time now spent to design and optimize solutions for our clients. And so a few specific examples of how we've leveraged some of the technologies talked about earlier today, uh, FQDN filtering and Aviatrix, internet, uh, Aviatrix FireNet, internet egress. So for egress FQDN, one of our first deployments in AWS involved an isolated workflow. It wasn't required or desirable to allow these workflows open internet access, but connectivity to a few select destinations from within AWS was required. We had a few options. We could back all the traffic to our data center. We could also deploy firewalls in each of the VPCs, but neither of those solutions was ideal. If we sent the traffic to the data center, it was creating an otherwise unnecessary dependency on infrastructure outside of AWS. Deploying firewalls for this environment was also unnecessary, both in terms of cost and management overhead. Uh, and while the destinations themselves were fairly static, I don't think any network engineer likes to rely on IP addresses staying to the same uh, DNS name that uh, resolving to the same DNS names resolving to the same IP addresses over time. So these workflows were already leveraging the Aviatrix transit network that Rod touched on earlier. What we were able to do is enable Aviatrix FQDN filtering, uh, which offered a simple but complete solution, especially considering that our gateways were already in the data path for this environment. Another solution that we were really excited to work with is Aviatrix's FireNet for egress internet. To truly embrace cloud, it's important for FactSet to have a native internet solution that was scalable, secure, and performant, all with a low management overhead. And while discussing requirements with our security group, we saw numerous advantages to maintaining the same next generation firewall OS that we trusted and were accustomed to, but in the cloud. A solution we could easily integrate into our existing AWS Transit Gateway topology would also be a plus. We found Aviatrix's controller-driven solution for AWS met all of our requirements. For one, it allowed us to scale our firewall capacity as needs grew without needing to tear down the existing infrastructure and rebuild it. Our performance wouldn't be limited by IPsec throughput, and it would easily integrate into our existing AWS Transit Gateway topology, and really importantly, uh, as part of our infrastructure as code pipelines. So in the end, uh, where did that leave us? In order for our clients and developers to benefit from the full feature set of cloud, we needed fast and secure internet access. With AWS and Aviatrix, we were able to quickly deploy within Amazon, bring security feature sets we were accustomed to on-prem into the cloud. It, it's allowed the network team to spend more time architecting and less time deploying, and it's enabled the network team themselves to more fully embrace modern IT best practices, which has increased the engineering quality of life and the stability of the network. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about any of the facts at technology stack or reach out to us, uh, you can please find the URL at the bottom there. And uh, I'll hand it back to Anjali now. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Dave. Uh, these are some references listed here for Transit Gateway, uh, VPC ingress routing, uh, guard duty, control tower, VPC endpoints, private link, and global accelerator. As a reminder, this recording will be made available um, to you guys. So. Don't worry about taking note of these. Um, and there's a few resources over here from Rod as well. Thanks, Anjali. Yeah, if you guys are interested in digging a little bit deeper with Aviatrix, of course, you could deploy it yourself this afternoon. All of this is launched out of the uh, AWS Marketplace. There's even an AWS Quick Start for some of the capabilities like the uh, uh, FQDN egress filtering that I talked about. But any questions that you have, uh, want to go into more detail, you can reach us at info at aviatrix.com. All of our documentation is published online at docs.aviatrix.com. And then also I encourage you to uh, take a look at the ACE multi-cloud networking certification. This is a self-paced and instructor-led classes that are available. But if you go to aviatrix.com slash ACE, 
take a look at that. That's become a very popular class uh, with a certification associated with it. Awesome. Okay, so thank you everybody. On that note, we're going to wrap up today's webinar. Uh, we want to thank you all very much for attending. If you have any other questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you everybody.